five. So first of all, thanks Katarina and, and other organizers for inviting me. It's, it's absolutely great pleasure to be in Cambridge. So it's my second time here, but the first time was just more or less overnight. So, so this is the first real one. And I enjoy this, this institute very much. So um, I hope I will just match the, the main line of the, of the twister theory, although I will not be talking about twisters. And instead, I will try to, to tell a bit about the story, how to recognize what are the, what are the right invariant differential operators to be used, say, in physics or other models, which would enjoy the right previously fixed groups of symmetries, right? So, and, and I'm, I'm using the, the buzzword generalized conformal calculus because what I will, will be talking about is going back to the four dimensional conformal geometry and actually the parallel transfer transport and all the constructions there. So in that sen this sense, it's clear I'm, I'm at least close to the topic, but what I want to show you is the way how you can turn the problem of classifying all the linear invariant operators for the given geometries or big class of geometries in terms of completely algebraic manipulations and stories. And that, that will go rather to representation theory to anywhere else, but, but it will all be concerning the differential operators. So why generalized conformal calculus? So the, the four dimensional conformal geometry as we have seen several times here is linked to, to the Lie algebra, which is this one. And you can either, either write it as uh, SL, uh, well, better, better, the more usual way, say SO, uh, what is it, 5, 1, R. And this is, of course, because it's the low dimensional case, so it's isomorphic to, to uh, well, I will, I will better go for the split form, right? So SO33R, and this will be isomorphic to SL4R. And in this way, if you want to see the structure, you simply, you simply write your algebra as the blockwise matrix scheme, where here you have got the G minus one, and here you have G0, G0, and here is G1. And this is the way how, if you complexify the Lorentzian homogeneous space or the Minkowski space, so you get the homogeneous space M equals G mod P, where in the complexified version, G would be the SL4C, which is the same as spin six. And P would be the Möbius group, the, the parabolic subgroup, which gives the conformal geometry, right? But in the, in the view of SL4R, it's this simple. And then of course, we have heard so many, so many uh, messages about how useful the tractors, et cetera, are. And then if you take the natural, so the standard representation of this, so you write the R4 here, you may notice that if you split it in the middle, then you get two two-dimensional slots, and all together, this is exactly the twist representation. And because it's it's a representation of the entire G, so on the fields of that kind, you have got the parallel transport, which comes from the canonical Cartan connection, right? So that's the that's the part of story which everybody, perhaps in the room has heard many times and from many different angles. And why the generalized conformal calculus? So generalized in the sense that you may, you may pick up the generalizations which would be different than higher dimensional conformal geometry, which essentially is completely different. And as we have heard from, from Arman a few hours ago, uh, actually, there, the structure is completely different. There, there you take this kind of structure of the algebra, right? You have G minus one, G minus one, G minus two here. 
and you have a you have a line of these kind of structures on Lie algebras if you go through A, B, C, D, etc. And the conformal geometry is, is simpler than the CR because it's anti-symmetric matrices, it's not, not anti-hermitian matrices. And therefore, this slot is zero. So there is no G minus two. But otherwise, it behaves very much algebraically, right? The CR, right? So, so but that's a that's a wrong hint for me because I'm not interested in the higher dimensional conformal. And instead, I would like to, to, to be able to use, say, the Penrose spinner calculus with the two indices separately, just creating the tension vectors, et cetera. And that means that we, we move to the Grassmannians. And we have heard about the Grassmannians here many times too. And there are two ways how to generalize the things. One of them is this one. And if the number of the knots it is odd and you take the right, the right real form, you end up with the almost quaternionic geometry. And in the quaternionic case, they behave very similar to the self-dual four-dimensional conformal, and many people work in there. But you also have, but but the drawback is that the two kind of spinners are of different dimensions, and then everything behaves quite different. And the other line of generalization, which perhaps would not be useful in physics, but from our point of view of mathematicians, why not, is that you insist that you have simply the same space and you take the space and it's dual and that makes you the tension space, right? Which is the case of the, of the Penrose's spinners and, and his calculus. And that's the case where you just take it symmetric. So, so you insist that the cross will be in middle. And I will try to give some algebraic, say, flash of information of what's available for the simplest case, which generalizes the, the four-dimensional conformal, and that's this one. Right, so in our case, we shall deal with G equals SL three plus three, so six R, which will be G minus one plus G zero plus G one. And blockwise, it will look exactly like here, except the, the blocks will not be, no more be two by two, but three by three, right? So in particular, the G minus one will be generated by, by the matrices with just one, one in all the nine, positions, and I will call them y, i, j, with i, j between 0 and, and, and 2. I don't know why, why Vladimir. So I, I forgot to say that, that all what I will be talking about today is a continuation and actually, uh, well, a new new memory of, 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 of what I was doing with Michael Eastwood in mid nineties, where we dealt with the general conformal calculus in all conformal dimensions, this algebraic vein and tried to classify the operators. And, and now we came back to that with Vladimir Socek and perhaps because we've been doing some calculations in Sage and Sage uses Python and numbers the things from zero. So, so he just uses this counting right? I don't see any other reason. Um, so, so that's the, that's something which will appear later. So this is, this is the general, say, motivation or, or, or explanation why generalized conformal calculus. Now, in which sense, it should be all algebraic. So it's quite straightforward. So, so the first step is to understand the Klein's Find uh, world. So that's exactly as there. So M is G mod G mod P. So it's the space of the three by three Grassmannians. So it's three planes in six dimensional space, right? So so that's our homogeneous space, and of course. It's 
It's a nice homogeneous space, very well understood. But we can just say in general that we have got something like, in general, in general, we can have, so M equals G mod P with any subgroup P in a Lie group G, so Lie subgroup with Maure Cartan form, which is just the left invariant parallelization of the of the space. Right? And there is the Maure Cartan equation. There are the Maure Cartan equation, d omega equals one half of omega omega. Right, and, and living on such a homogeneous space uh, the and, and talking about the invariance, which would be just with respect to the subgroup P, we want to know what are the, or, or the whole group G. So we want to know what are the, 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 the spaces where the say fields for a physicist could live. And that's the homogeneous bundles. So vector bundles with an action of G, which is, which is covering the action on the manifold M, right? And as a simple observation, we can find out that all of them is, are, are coming from a P module. So, so we take a P module E and we build G cross over P E, so the associate bundle, which is the same as viewing, say, vectors as mappings from frames to, to coordinates. So, so these are bundles over M and sections. Sections are, well, we can view them, of course, as, as sections of this bundle, but, but they, are, they are actually mappings from G to E, which are equivariant. Right, so, so it's the same like telling that if you want to view your vector in different frames, so the different frame is obtained by multiplying from the right with the element of the gauge group, and the coordinates are changing by multiplying from the left with the inverse, right? So it's always like that. And, and, and I think in the Klein's world is that that uh, if you have such a homogeneous bundle, so I will, I will call the bundle, say, E. So if I start with a module blackboard bolt E, then the bundle will be color, uh, script E. Then, of course, the action of G on the sections is well-defined, and, and it's nothing but uh, the action of P on the sections is well defined. And also you have the action of G on that, which is just defined by the construction in an obvious way. So if you view the section this way, so it means the action from the left is, is composition with the multiplication by the inverse from the right. right? So in particular, if we want to deal with differential operators, so if D is going from, say, E to F, differential operator, linear, then, of course, this is nothing but a mapping from the jet prolongation. So it's just D going from some JK of E into F. And if the operator should be invariant with respect to the action of the group, which I indicated how to define it just now, then it's obvious that essentially it's the same thing as, as mappings from, well, I will write it JK of E. That's the module, which is just the JK of E at the origin, origin is just the, the distinguished point in the client space, which is the projection of the unit, right? Uh, 
and this is this is a lot well should be yes that was y and this goes to f right because f is just a is identified with the fiber over the over the uh, distinguished point in the client world. So, so that's how it works. And this, this is a p-module homomorphism. p-module homomorphism. Whereas here, this is a g-equivariant. G mapping, right? So now it looks like, well, so what? So to classify linear differential operator, it's enough to, to classify the p-module homomorphisms between two p-modules. Looks like a nice algebraic task. The problem is it's not. It's not because unlike you are in some something like, say, a Riemannian geometry where everything is reductive and the, the client's worlds are sort of very special and where you can say what, what the operators would be in terms of the Levi-Civita connection, et cetera. For example, in the conformal geometry, it's algebraically very much messed up because the G minus is a sub-module with respect to G0, but not with G1 because the brackets of those two land in the G0. And if you bracket them again, you land in G1. So it just completely goes out of hand, right? So, so, so similarly, even if we start with trivial representation E, wherever you go higher than say second order jets, it's more or less hopeless to understand the structure of the, G of the module in a nice way. So it's too complicated. And before the way out, the way out, which the people found very long back, in particular people like, like Gelfand and Kostand, is that, of course, it's, it looks like obvious that you would like to change the game and instead of looking for the mappings from a horrible module to a nice module, so let, let's expect that we are in one of the parabolic geometries, like our Grassmannian case, and we would like to, to describe all of those operators. So, so um, we would ask for the answer for irreducible P modules. And we know that irreducible P modules in our case are irreducible G0 modules with trivial action of G1. So, so there is just good overview of them. And what we can do is we can just take the dual and try to embed the dual to the JKE dual, right? So that's that's the attempt because because if you want to see submodules even in a horrible structure, it's much more promising than you know which one you look for, right? And then you look whether it's there or not. And these are in the case of the semi-simple. Uh, it's highest weight modules with respect to the semi-simple part of G0 plus some action of the center, so it's well understood. So actually what we need is to find the same high weight vectors, which are called singular vectors here in this dual. So what we want to do is to understand this dual, and the good thing is to forget about K and write infinity here, right? So because we don't know which order the operator should have. And this is a gadget which is not difficult to understand. So you can imagine you, you simply take the elements xi from the, from the g, and you understand the xi as a left invariant vector field on, on the group. So every element in the algebra is a left invariant vector field in this way. And and you can simply send sigma to something like x1, x2, xk on sigma. You simply differentiate your function. It's a function valued in a module, so in the vector space, and you differentiate it in the direction of the vector field. And you do it, for example, in the, in the origin, right? So in the unit. And so each word 
of the axis gives you some differential operation, which will be of the case order. It looks like that, right? And so you see that you could start with the tensor algebra of G, which is just the, the vector space generated by that. So, so if I make linear combinations of such operations, I land here, right? But now, of course, now of course you you know that if you commute the left invariant vector fields, it's the same like differentiate in the direction of the bracket, right? So, so you can swap. But also, what you know is that if you if you happen to have some of the axes which are which are actually vertical, which are coming from the real algebra P, then by the equivariance, you know that the action will not be differential, it will be algebraic. It will be minus the action, the, 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 the representation, right? So, so actually what we have to do is, first of all, we have to quotient out a module, which is, well, uh, an ideal, which is uh, of this kind. which is what the people call the universal envelope in algebra of G. And then we imagine that in this, if we act with these guys, so you, we have already got read about the, say, uh, dependence on the commutations. So what we can do is we, we can split everything into the, the elements, so we choose some complement, and we use this so-called bot borel poacare uh, bot with uh, procedure and we we bubble everything vertical to be hitting the sigma first and therefore it goes to the other side right and also if you want to have the du want to have the dual we would rather prefer to to land in scalars so we we simply tensorize this with the dual of of e right so in the end of the day we end, we end up with the so-called generalized Verma module in the case of semi-simple and parabolic and induced module in general. And the induced module in general is of this kind. So it's UG tensor product over UP with E star, right? And this is the beginning of the algebraic story, really, because now, surprisingly enough, instead of dealing with horrible P modules and looking for P module homomorphisms, we look into, into the problem of, of understanding the singular vectors, so the highest weight vectors sitting inside of this module. But on top of that, this module is a UG module. So, Instead of having only P action, we have got the entire G action. And in the case of the parabolic geometries, G is semi-simple. So for the semi-simple V groups, we can get much more information about the structure, et cetera. In particular, there is a huge center of, of, of the universal enveloping algebra, and, and it's a UG module. And, and the center of the universal enveloping algebra has to act the same way on the sources and targets of operators. So, so the infinite sets of, and, and the action of the center of the universal enveloping algebra is called the, <clears throat> is called the infinitesimal character. So, so from scratch, if we start with a geometry like this one, the three, three Grassmannians, we know that there will be a complete description of all the linear differential operators acting between the, the interesting homogeneous vector bundles coming from irreducible P modules uh, in terms of the homomorphisms of the Verma modules. And the homomorphism of the Verma modules can appear only between Verma modules with the same infinitesimal character, right? Right, so this is this is the story, the algebraic story. This goes back many decades. And 
since then, there was a lot of interest in representation theory in these kind of things. And there, there is this Harish Chandra theory and, and, and all the kind of very smart results. And I had the feeling many times that essentially nearly all the people from the representation theory forgot that, that the beginning was about knowing something about jets and differential operators, right? But some people still did. And, and it, it goes on this way. Right, so um, in particular, I will not go into details because the time is limited, but the structure theory says roughly the following up to, up to say singular characters, I will come to later, is the regular ones. Everything looks almost like the, the RAM sequence decomposed into irreducible components. And on top of the exterior differentials there, you have some so called non standard operators appearing. And the non standard operators appear in such a way that they, they, they are simply uh, a bit more strange, whereas the standard ones, they, they all appear then in the so called BGG resolution. And you can construct them via tractor calculi and, 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 and different way. And the original construction for the, for the Klein's models were completely algebraic, right? Um, now, yeah, and what I wanted to say, it almost looks like this because there is the so-called janssen zuckerman translation principle, which says that uh, each, each of the subcategory of the same, of the objects of the same infinitesimal character is mutually uh, equivalent with every other in the whole category of the given geometry. And there are the two, uh, a joint functors built by Janssen and Zakroman, which, which just give you explicitly this, this correspondence, right? I can, I can first show you how it looks. So then what I prepared here, well, actually I have first to put them up both. How it looks in our case, right? So. So in order to understand it, I will need to explain a little bit the notation. So, so in our in our case of G equals SL six R, and the P inside is is as as given here. So this is the P. Um, there is the following way how to how to write down the weights. So one of many ways, but I will use this one. So because we are in SL, so you can write the SL weights in such a way that you write each weight as A, A, B, C, D, E, F. And the letters A, B, C, D, E, F correspond to the action of the individual diagonal components in the diagonal here. So therefore there are six. So it's, it's a little bit different than what we are used to see with the weights because, because the usual weights for SL6 would have only five components and they correspond to the action over, over, of EI minus EI plus one. And therefore this is equivalent to A minus B, B minus C, uh, C minus D, D minus E, and E minus F, right? So this will be the weight as the sum of fundamental weights of the SL representation. And writing in this, it, in this way, helps us very much because if we write it in this way, the action of the veil group gets extremely easy to understand, right? The action of the veil group on the weights written in this way. So, so of course, this means that, that A is strictly bigger than B is strictly bigger than C is strictly bigger. Uh, no, 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 wrong. A is greater than or equal to B, greater than or equal to C, greater equal B, E, F, because we want, 
these to be integral positives, right? So, so these are integral with this condition. And the action of the veil group, if you write the weight in this way, is simply given by permutations. So all permutations are actually the orbit of the weight. So it's extremely easy. And in general, it's true that the infinitesimal, infinitesimal characters uh, are equal, equal if and only if the weights lambda and mu on the same orbit in the affine action of veil group. Right, so affine action of the veil group means that we add, we add the group, we, we add the weight, which corresponds to the so-called lowest weight. So the sum of all fundamental weight is added to each of the weights, and then we perform the veil act group action, and then we subtract, right? So that's the affine action. So therefore, so it means that we have the row that's the lowest weight. And in our case, of course, just having written the weights this way means that they are actually given up to equivalence, right? Because if I add the same constant to each of those, I will get the same weight. So usually the people normalize it. I will, I will prefer to have f equals zero but not necessarily, but that, that's one of the possible normalizations. And the row is then equal five, four, three, two, one, zero, right? So that's the row. And if I add the row to these guys, then I get the usual convention of how the people also write the weights, right? So, so it's, it's just helps in the computation. So now, that's the that's the weights for G, right? So that's the G weights. Now, what about the p-dominant weights? P-dominant weights. And here it's quite easy because, again, just using using this strategy, a uh, G weight would be well. What I was talking about here was about G dominant weights, right? And now a general G weight can be dominant when restricted to P, right? And if you look at this way, then what you need is you understand that there are actually, there are actually two SL3s here plus the one dimensional center. And the action of the two SL3s means that you simply understand the ABC as this kind of weight for the first copy. And you understand the BEF as the thing for the second copy. And then you ask, what is the action of the center? Right, and the action of the center is easy to compute. Action of the center of the grading element, so, so the canonical generator of the center. So there, it's the element in the center of the G0, which acts by the adjoint representation by minus one here and by plus one here. There is always, you know, all all parabolic subalgebras, there is always one such element which makes it right. So the action of the grading element is very easy to compute. It's one half of A plus B plus C minus B minus E minus F. So that's very straightforward, right? And uh, it's very, so if we, if we take the, the orbits of the same infinitesimal character for the Verma modules generated by such P modules. And it's very easy to recognize what is the orbit. We simply take 
one such weight and all the permutations of the of the numbers which satisfy the rules which are necessary so here the rules are weakened right so so if we add the alpha uh, the the rows so so if if we say alpha will be a row plus our weight lambda then of course the conditions will be that A must be strictly bigger than B, must be strictly bigger than C, and the same with D, E, and F, and I can take F equals zero, right? Just to be on the normalized side. And now, now what I do is, I just translated what it means to be p-dominant. To be p-dominant, it simply means it simply means if I write it this way, so it's plus rho, right? Then I know that it must be A bigger than B bigger than C and independently D bigger than E bigger than F, right? And that's it. But we also can say what are the other infinitesimal characters because an infinitesimal character is regular, which means that there are no, so, so all the, I mean, the, the P dominant weight, if you add the row, it should be G dominant. And it's regular if it's not plying on intersection of two walls. It might be on a wall, but not on intersection of two. Right? And then you have all the pattern of these characters of the same infinitesimal thing always the same, which is already seen from here, because you simply start with some fixed tuple of, of, of numbers, and you take all the you take all the uh, combinations which make sense as p-dominant weights, right? And that's exactly the pattern without the arrows yet. So we do not get the complete Hasse diagram, but but at least the knots of it, right? This easy way. So, so that's specific for the for the Grassmannian geometries for for this SL. So it's it's very easy going and nice. And so, for example, if we take this, if we take this two two geometry, right? So so I was yeah. And 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 what I what I wanted to say and forgot is that those infinitesimal characters which are sitting on the intersection of walls would have the feature that in the affine orbit of the veil action or in the orbit of the affine veil action, there will be repetitions. So each of the weight repeats several times and some of them will not be p-dominant. And for example, this happens, you see in the four dimensional case, which is just the same as ours, except we, we forget about the last two knots. On the, the, the boundary knots, you see we, you can start with two one one zero. So it's it's the kind of weight which the with the row edit, and it's typically singular because one is repeated there. So so if they were all different, it would be a regular singular character, but it's not. And now we have the standard scheme, which is having normally the shape as over there. So so as you know. How the Deram looks in how the Deram looks in uh, four-dimensional conformal geometry. You have functions, then the one forms, then the two forms split into the self-dual and anti-self-dual. Then you have three forms and top forms, right? So that's the picture over there. And in this case, two of the weights would not make sense as p-dominant weights. Therefore, the the spaces are not there. And what normally is obtained in the middle, in the central diamond of the of the Deram for the four-dimensional conformal as the, as the composition of the restricted differential to the values in the self-dual and the differential going from self-dual to further. So instead such composition of two first order operators, you get a second order operator, which is in this case, the famous Yamabe conformal invariant Laplace operator. So that's just, just to have some flavor how it looks in general in the conformal case. And now, now let's look at the picture in our, in our 
three, three Grassmannians. And this is, so the regular case is this picture. So I, I have to go a bit further just to see myself what's there. Um, right, so, so there is a few things to observe, unfortunately. Ah, yeah, the dot is there. So first of all, you see that this, I was, I'm, I'm skipping the other three, right? Because if I, if I write, so, so this five, four, three, two, one, zero is the row shifted weight for the trivial representation. So if I had just zeros there in the sum, I get the row itself, right? So that's it. And whenever you write A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, E, F. So if I write the, and I know that A is strictly bigger than B, bigger than C and so on. then if I write the first three, the other three are given, so you don't have to write them, right? So they are just the remaining three, and there must be in the right order, otherwise it doesn't make sense. It wouldn't be p-dominant, right? So therefore, I write only the first three here. And you see, these are the functions. So it's it's just the it's just the the trivial representation part of the Deram. And, and these are the top forms. And then you have got the one forms, and then there are all the other things are there. And of course, as you, as you would expect, all those things much appear, which, which would be visible there from geometries where you forget only one or both of the boundary points, right? So you see that, I mean, it's, if you, if you are not used to that, and also the the long dotted ones and then dashed ones are too much seen to see the structure in the background now. So in the in the picture, I would have it colored. It would be easier uh, if, if beamed by. But with some effort, you perhaps might see just focus only on the on the solid arrows, right? And you can see that there is one wall here. It's something like three dimensional picture. There is a wall here, which looks like which looks like this. And this would be the Deram. This would be the Deram for the case where you forget only one of the points here. So it's something like going towards the quaternionic geometries, although you wouldn't have the right form there, so it's it's just the Grassmannian kind of this, right? So, with this odd num this even number of knots in total. Uh, so, so this is just just this wall, right? So every and you can also see that it's everything which in the first three numbers which ends with zero. So it's this, this, these two, and this one, right? So it looks exactly this way. But you have also everything which starts with five. It's something like the bottom there. Then you have the next layer. This ev everything which starts with four, and that's exactly like the conformal thing. And then you have everything which starts with three, and this is like if I forgot the next one here. So if I would forget those two and one here, and that's three-dimensional, uh, two-dimensional projective, right? Two-dimensional projective geometry. So it sits here. And then there is the, the other ones, right? So this is how, how automatically the, the, uh, the RAM decomposes for the, for the three, three Grassmannians. And on top of all the solid arrows, which are just restricted exterior differentials, they are all of first order, you have on top of that, six operators, which are the dotted ones, and these are fourth order operators. And you have got one of these long ones, which is seventh order operator, and the biggest one is a ninth order operator. So it's pretty similar like in the four dimensional conformal, where you see you have just these, these solid arrows, and then there is one more there, which is a fourth order. If we would go to, to the next one, just adding one knot here, one knot here, 
then we would just get something very similar, but so complicated that I wouldn't dare to, to, to draw it at all. So there would be 70, 70 nodes there and pretty many operators. And there would be also a longest arrow, which would be of, of order 16. And there would be many of ninth, of ninth order ones, even more of seven orders one and, and a heap of fourth order ones, which are all non-standard operators. For those who know the tractor calculus, the non-standard are uh, still possibly strong in the area. And that's the point I'm going to in the last 12 minutes, uh, because the whole story about the calculus is not to retell what the people in representation theory know, but to tell what, what is the structure of these invariant linear operators in case you are on curved manifolds. So, so that means that I have to use this part of the breadboard here and explain how to come over to Cartan's world. And if you come over to Cartan's world, so it's easy because we heard, I mean, it should be easy for everybody in the room. We heard many lectures about that already. So you have instead a manifold with the Grassmannian structure, which means one of the kind of parabolic G structures where, where the structure group is just the, the SL3 plus SL3 plus the center plus the plus the G1, right, sitting inside of this. And the structure means that you, you identify the tangent space with tensor product of an auxiliary three-dimensional bundle with its dual, and you identify the top degree forms, just to have the normalization, not to be in G, GL6R, but SL6R in those, right? So, so that's, the, that's the change. So we are dealing with a specific G structure, which is the curved version of these Grassmannians. And as we know, there is a canonical construction of a Cartan connection. So what we've got is G over M with Cartan connection omega, which is in omega one calligraphic G, very in G, and it's got the, all the, all the properties of the maurer cartan form, which still makes sense, except there is curvature here, right? Sorry, so with curvature. And uh, now we can go through through the rest here and everything makes sense. So we, we don't talk about homogeneous vector bundles because there is no G action anymore there, but, they are, but there is the category and the functor from modules to, to associate bundles where, where we construct the bundles, which are called natural bundles for, for the geometry, say. The sections are again equivariant mappings of the same kind. The differential operators, which would enjoy some invariance and are given by invariant construction, should be given by the jets. But, but there is something new here, because here in the Klein's world, we knew that, that the JK of E is again equal by the very construction G, uh, G cross over P JK of E. So we have this identification. And therefore, that was the crucial point which I left below the carpet, allowing us to identify the problem or, or make the problem of finding the invariant operators equivalent to the problem of finding the homomorphisms. And this is no more true. So, so J, K of E is no more not identified with was G cross P J K of E or K bigger than two. For the first order and second order jets, it works. For higher order, it doesn't. There is a nice moral from that observation because it means that whatever operator is of first order or second order is obtained by a homomorphism. 
and therefore it extends and, and, and lifts on all the manifolds, right? So the curvature might pop up somewhere in an alternative description of those, but in general, the same module homomorphism must give you a well-defined invariant operator. For orders bigger than two, it's no more true, right? And the miraculous and mysterious thing that people were struggling about to understand is the dotted arrow in the conformal situation in the four, four, four dimension conformal world because this dashed arrow does not come from a homomorphism of the modules in the curved world. And I will try in my remaining minutes to explain what do I mean by that. So the, the way out of, of this is to notice that actually it works for J1, and therefore you may iterate the J1. And you may also write down a, a nice explicit formula using something which we call fundamental derivatives. I will not go into details to write explicitly how to sort of get the universal jet operator, except the universal jet operator is no more having values in the holonomic jets, but we have to go to the semi-holonomic jet. So we take the equalizer of all the projections of the iterated application of J1. So we go to the semi-holonomic jet, which means that we do the same as all of us, except our derivatives are no more commutative. So, so the derivatives will, so the jet bundle is no more modeled over the symmetric tensor products, but on general tensor products, right? And this is isomorphic to, to G cross over P K bar K of the module. So this is, this is very important. Right, and now, now it means that we can do exactly the same thing as here, except that we would have the so-called semi-holonomic Verma modules. And the semi-holonomic Verma modules are defined exactly the same way, except we take the semi-holonomic universal algebra where we simply want, we simply want, it, that's the TG, where we quotient out a smaller ideal. We can quotient out only an ideal, which at least one of those two would be in, in P. So we need one of those vectors to be vertical to allow us to commute, right? Because there is the curvature. And if, if, if both of them are horizontal, then because of the curvature is no more true that, that we can just replace the commutator by the bracket, right? So, so, so this is the way. And, and of course, we, here we may already use the usual universal enveloping because it's all in P. And we again have got this guy here. And so, so everything structurally works the same way as here, except we don't know anything about the center. Perhaps it would be very small or not existing. I don't know. But what we, what we were able to find out and fix with Mike this nearly 30 years back was that in the conformal case, we use the fact that <coughs> We use the fact that the uh, fundamental representations are all, if you view them, I mean the fundamental G representation, if you view them as P modules, they are filtered as modules and the length is at most two for all the fundamental things, right? So it's very nice there. Um, and so you can use the a alternative version of the translation principle by Janssen and Zuckerman, and we edit the observation that actually you can use the translations not only with the highest weights and lowest weights, but also working with the middle weights. I will not bother you with any details, but very recently I, I put a, a survey paper on explaining all this on ERCSIF. So if you are interested, just download it there, and it's about 20 pages explaining all the details, how these things work in general. 
it's our background for this work is, is Vladimir because we didn't want to, to write it in, in the genuine paper here. So we better wrote the survey. And, and the skewed translations with the weights in the middle are sometimes going both ways. That's if it's between what we call equisingular. So, so it should be in the same, same uh, say, regularity or singularity group. Or you can also have extraordinary translations which take singular ones and translate the operators to less singular, singular ones. And the, the quest we are going for is that actually what we do is we have the embedding of the target space into the Verma module of the original one, which is the same thing as finding a highest weight vector W here, right? Which is of the weight of the highest weight vector here. So, so it will be the so-called singular vector. And now we have our natural projection and we want to find a cover of the embedding, which means exactly we need to, because because this semi-holomic Verma module is again, is again highest weight module. So we want to cover the singular vector from downstairs to singular vector upstairs. And what we what we proved and what it's more or less obvious is that whatever you can get by translation from an operator which does exist, and if the translation uses only splittings and projections in the filtered modules you need for that, which are of length at most two, because they all are coming from operators as well, so they exist, then you know that it will be possibly covered, right? And in this picture, which is pretty amusing, at least for us, is that uh, unlike we expected, all the, all the non-solid arrows here, so all the all the dotted ones in the middle, and also this dashed one, do come from homomorphisms of this of this uh, semi-holomy Verma modules, and it's just three here in the picture which do not. This one, the longest one, where we don't have a concise proof yet, but we are close to, I believe. And then the ones which either start or end in the very end, so in the line bundles. Those two simply do not come from the homomorphisms. But all the other do, right? Which was a surprise. Another interesting thing is that I didn't tell, but it's the same in the, uh, well, it's the same as in the conformal case and all other parabolic geometries, all the, all the diamonds here. So always you have two arrows, composition, another composition. So they are always non-trivial and they are always equal to each other up to the opposite sign. So they're, if you add them together, you get, you get zero, but there is a standard operator of second order in the Dirham here, right? And the same is true also for all squares, which include the dotted arrows. And those which do not exist as the semi-holomic version are exactly only those which do not appear in any of those squares or are in the very beginning and the end here, right? So, 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 so I mean, yeah, so, so because it looks like this is also a square, but it's not here. Here you need to compose three. And there is just one more composition in the flat world, which is non-trivial and that's the, there's the composition of the diagonal, getting the diagonal in the cube in the middle. So if you go from here to here, so you have several options. One of them is that. And this is also a non-trivial operator. All the other compositions are trivial. This is not true in the curved versions, right? So we now know that all the curved versions exist and it depends on the curvature. And, and just the, the last sentence, uh, it's actually very interesting then for each of the particular geometries, for example, in the Batanonic ones, uh, 
then if you restrict the curvature a bit, just, just to, to one bar, in our case, there are just two torsions as the harmonic component of curvature, right? So if you restrict one of them to be zero, then definitely some big parts of the scheme will be subcomplexes, even in the, in the curved case, right? And that's like the Salamon complex for the quaternionic manifolds and similar stuff. So perhaps I was too ambitious one day to tell too much, but Time is gone, so I will stop. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, for all these operators where it's, where it's, uh, for all the operators where it's uh, symmetric, right? So if you have, I have cross in the middle and then the same number of knots to the left and to the right in a Grassmannian, they, there always will be the very longest arrow, which is obtained exactly the same way as in the four dimensional geometry. So the highest vector, the, the highest weight vector, the singular vector which defines it is obtained as the determinant of the, of this matrix. But in the four dimensional case, it's just the determinant written in the DD of that, that thing, right? So, so this is a nice operator for the, for us. There, well, for each of the geometry, there is always a line, well, a, a sequence of these. So you have the determinant, you have the square of the determinant, you have the cube of the determinant and it seems that it always will be the case that, that uh, I mean, here the determinant gives you the, in the, in the two dimensional case, the determinant gives you the Yamabe operator. If you take the determinant square, you get the, the, the Panates operator, which does not exist as a strong invariant operator because it doesn't come from the homomorphism. But by chance, it does exist as an operator. And the reason is that, that uh, if you look at the picture here, so because I deal with the semi-holonomic jets, so unlike the classical situation, the symmetric one where your jets of section automatically hit the complete vector space of the jets. And so it's one-to-one -one correspondence. Here, actually, because of the Bianchi and Ricci and their differential consequences, you are always ending with your operator in a very wide algebraic subvariety in this guy. And it's enough to secure the invariance of your G0 equivariant uh, mapping for the operator on this subvariety. And this happens for the panates, right? And this seems to be, in some sense, repeated in all the, all the higher, all the longer uh, linking diagrams. So, so for us, we have got, we have got, well, the determinant, which is of third order. It's a distinguished operator, which is, which is appearing between line bundle and it's two singular case, right? So it, it, it's on intersection of, of, of more walls. Uh, then you have the, the square of the Laplacian and that's, that's again, that's again on uh, a strongly invariant operator coming from, from the homomorphism. And you can prove that easily by, by translations, right? And then, then we come to the third power of the determinant, which is the longest one. And there we don't have the proof yet completely. But actually I wanted to tell how, how you can prove that the other two are not available as, as morphism. And that's, that's very amusingly simple because you, you simply find out but very, very straightforward arguments that you can restrict the problem to the four dimensional conformal where the answer is known by once for one of the ends you, you consider a sub, sub uh, algebra here with vanishing first column and, and first, last, first and last column and row which is four dimensional conformal. And in the other one, you do the same with the inner two columns and rows. 
and you get very simple arguments saying that if you have a singular vector, it must not use the y's from those parts, and therefore it must be also a singular vector for the conformal, and you know it doesn't exist. So, so the proof there turned out to be extremely easy. But the long one, it's not that easy because we, we, we found a way how to compute it explicitly and nicely, which would work, except when I try to, to throw it into Maple or Sage. So the number of term, terms in the expressions to be held, handled is some couple of millions and, and my computer didn't manage. But, but there is a way out and, and, and we haven't tried too much yet, but it definitely will work. 